So first, I'd love you guys to just uh, start here and go down the, the panel, do a quick intro of you, your background, your company, and what's going on with you. Sure. Go ahead, Arjun. I'm Arjun Banshal. Uh, I also moved to San Diego 10 years ago, just like Neil, and uh, initially worked at a new market chip project over at Qualcomm. Along the way, started two startups. Uh, one was called Nirvana Systems, which was one of the first and uh, fastest deep learning frameworks and <laughs> cloud service providers. And the second was uh, Exokine, which was an AI travel agent. And in between, I worked at uh, Intel, leading their AI software and research groups, uh, following the acquisition of my first company by Intel. And more recently, I've been advising startups with using ChatGPT and uh, also building some open source tooling to help with that. Awesome. Vinny? Hi, I'm Vinny. I'm originally from South Africa. Moved to the Bay Area 15 years ago and then San Diego nearly five years ago. Been building companies for the past two decades. Um, I've done ad tech, SaaS, um, mobile payments, blockchain, uh, you know, and now video conferencing. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, what else? Um, yeah. I've been through a lot in the Valley. It was kind of a traumatic experience. The so company in San Diego was, was actually a really great uh, turning point in my life, and I'm happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Afif Khoury. Um, I run a company called Soshi Inc. Uh, it's a marketing technology company, um, enterprise software to help uh, brands market everywhere. Um, it's not what I've always done. I'm actually not a marketer. I'm probably the worst marketer in my company. Um, I would, my wife met me when I was running a genetics lab at UCSD, um, and then I became an attorney at some point, and then a venture capitalist, and then I saw this thing called digital marketing and did a company, and now it's going pretty well, so look forward to talking about it. Yeah, what, 10 years ago, we shared an office space where we each yeah. had like one desk where five people each crammed into it, and... Uh, uh, no, no, look where you are. I think my first customer came into Evo Nexus, and I asked all the other companies around me to take their signs down, so it looked like we were really big, <laughs> and we really had like three people, but yeah, those were the good old days. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, Afif, why don't you kick it off? Um, talk a little bit about AI in your business today, uh, if you guys are using it, how you're using it, some of the tangible benefits, um, and if it's been a good experience or, or a bad experience. AI at home is like this fun little tool I play with for my kids and sometimes secretly write their essays with. <laughs> uh, at work, I see it as, you know, every maybe two decades, you have this transformational technology that can change the landscape in a lot of ways. Um, for us, we've had a vision for about two years that we've been working on and building AI models internally to do it to take software, just really categorically software from, from a tool that as humans we walk up to and execute some task on to a partner that actually you tell it what you need to do, you teach it, and then it's off executing for you almost, almost like a high functioning employee. Um, for us, that would be in the marketing space. With some of the newer AI models, it's vastly catalyzed those efforts um, to where basically we are now building a co-marketing platform and changing really the relationship that our customers have with software from, again, something they have to walk up to, digest data, make decisions, go execute a, a campaign, to don't do any of that. You're actually really not very good at it, but this machine is incredible at it. It knows all the data. It knows what you should do. It can click all the buttons that you can and create the images. It can write the text. It can track the... Uh, you know, the, the correlations between what you're doing in this channel and, and the outcomes in that channel, and you go run your business. And, and that sort of set it and forget it, get it mindset of software, I think, is, is where the industry grows and how AI becomes sort of just a, a catalytic technology to transform an entire industry. Vinny, how about you? How are you, what are you, what are you seeing in your business? What are you using in your business? Um, and, and how's the experience been so far? Yeah, so, so Wait Room started nearly three years ago. Uh, we've been building from scratch a full stack video conferencing platform. Um, we started off with one of, the, one of the cool features was giving people to sort of queue up for, for sessions and you could have um, you know, a queue-based way of running meetings, uh, like office hours. Um, we've since expanded past that and it's, it's just generally full stack. Within the next two, three weeks, it's pretty much on par with what 
the big players, Zoom and, and Hangouts and everyone else does. Um, and pretty high quality as well. Um, but the, what we've learned in the past year and a half is, so when we started the company, one of the things we wanted to do is make meetings sort of a lot more easier. So not having to take notes, um, you know, having clips of what's, what is said, maybe even a highlights reel, uh, auto-generated. And we started using GPT-3, I would say, I think it's like 18 months ago. And it was very rudimentary at that point. So we could do things, it, it kind of did some transcription, it wasn't very good. It would generate titles, it would generate descriptions of clips that we had. Um, and as it's improved to 3.5 and now we're on 4, it's just blown our minds in terms of what's possible with, with, um, with video conferencing. So we're effectively built, you know, we're basically layering AI into this platform as deeply as we can. So, I mean, some features we're launching next month is something called catch up, right? So when you're in a 20 person meeting and you come in you know, 15 minutes late, instead of having to get in there and you know, apologize for why you're late and what happened, what I missed, there's a summary, AI generated, this is what happened, these are the action points, this is the task, et cetera. In, in a minute of reading before you enter the room, you know exactly what happened before you get in. At the end of the meeting, there'll be a meeting summary sent to everyone. Um, in the meeting, if you decide to have a follow-up meeting, the system can send out invites to everyone in that meeting and you can accept the client or whatever the case is. So we're basically building an intelligent agent that sits inside all your video conferencing meetings. And this is more for companies, obviously. So think of it as a, like a corporate assistant that's basically taking notes, uh, action items, looking up information in Notion or, or Jira. You could even ask the agent a question in the middle of the, of the session. Who's the head of this department in the company? And in big companies, obviously, there's a lot of people, so they, you know, it would know automatically. It has access to the, to the employee base and, and um, yeah. And, and just take it one step further, I think within three to five years, most companies will be run by AI-assisted uh, meetings, whether it's in person or, or video. And things like conflicts between departments. Uh, logistics is planning to ship a product on the 15th, but production's just found out that it's gonna be delayed by two weeks, and they don't talk to each other, right? It normally has to flow up to a manager, then the manager meeting happens the next week, and then they find out that there's a, a shipping. This is all gonna be automated, and this is all gonna be real time. So we think that natively building AI into uh, video conferencing is gonna be a, a really big um, uh, you know, a paradigm shift in the industry. Versus what Zoom does right now is they have this marketplace where there's 20 different AI apps and note-taking apps and summary apps and you have to choose one and, you know, and we just think we want to build a sort of Apple-esque approach to doing that. Yeah, you, you layered in a number of amazing use cases uh, for the future and, and that was kind of my next question too is, you know, where do you see us going in three to five years? And, Man, the communication between departments, I've had to deal with that in operational roles. It's, it's a disaster and a nightmare in most companies and it's really hard to do well. Um, and I think uh, what we're seeing is the reason potentially why there's such a big leap today is that it's just so accessible and it's so good at what it can do. You can really fine tune it to do a specific thing really well, plug it into your product and then move to the next. And thing. it learns, right? So from, from the organization, it, it learns, okay, you're a manufacturing company. These are the things that are important to you. These are things we should watch out for. Yeah. Um, and, and at scale, it gets very difficult for, you know, I, I think middle management's gonna basically be wiped out to a large extent in bigger companies because if you have a thousand person organization, there's probably somewhere in the region of four, to 6,000 meetings happening a day across the entire company, it's impossible for any group of managers or, or, or um, you know, people to sort of manage the flow of information across the company. And I think David Sachs put out a tweet about a month ago um, saying that like, you know, in the future, the CEOs are gonna basically run the company using AI. And I think this is kind of the first step towards that because if you can capture all this information, it's all transcribed, it's all there, um, the CEO gets a, you know, an email or alert when things are not working in the company because they have full access to the information across the organization. So I, I think we're gonna get there. Yep. It's gonna take a while. It seems a bit creepy, big brother-ish, but think about it today. All, all, big companies especially, all your calls are monitored, all your emails are monitored, there's flagging, on it's already there. So you, know, you might as well, you know, when you're using the stuff for work purposes, it, you know, <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Arjun, give us a little on what you've been working on and what's happening in your world and, and what kind of stuff you're using and leveraging today. Yeah, yeah, I think echoing what uh, Afif and Vinny talked about, it's a really exciting time. I think many of us have been working in this space for many years and the chat interface has really caught people's imagination. And so uh, what I'm seeing kind of is uh, working with startups that are building things like CRMs and uh, financial advisors and 
um, just like knowledge assistance, like new kinds of products that can get enabled through these chat GPT type of features. Obviously the promise is there, you know, you know, my grandparents understand it now, my cousins who are not technical in any way are contacting me, long lost friends who have become MDs are talking about its potential to take notes and simplify that whole process of visiting a doctor. Uh, but uh, it's, it's still not kind of super reliable when put into a production setting as is. So there's some additional tooling that's needed around what you get from the APIs. And so that's something I've been spending a bit of time on um, because I see a similar trend happened about seven, eight years ago when deep learning was really taking off. Uh, we had to go in and build a lot of the production grade tooling to have enterprises actually make use of it. And, um, and so I think that's gonna look kind of similar in some ways, but also very different. Um, and I think some of the really exciting possibilities are that now there's a lot more, uh, just like developers coming in, there's uh, product managers coming in. It's not just like confined to AI experts and data scientists in this wave. Yep. And so uh, the kinds of tools you can build, you know, you can think about trying to unify things like Mixpanel, which were used by product managers in the past, and your monitoring and logging software, which might have been used only by the engineers, and your ML kind of development stack, which might have been used only by the data scientists. So, so I think those are some of the kind of topics where I've been spending my time and, and building out some kind of open source tooling around that. Yeah, so we've talked already about user interface kind of improvements. We've talked about operational improvements and we've talked about backend data analysis kind of improvements, right? Um, so it's amazing to see how widely um, this very new technology is already being applied. And so there's, you know, ChatGPT, it's a, it's a large language model or an LLM, right? And you know, it's got some extra stuff built into it, but some are saying the big companies like OpenAI and Google, they will, they will own that layer. Um, and whether that's true or not, uh, we don't know. But I think what, what I'd like to kind of move the conversation into is more of some of the layer two things. You know, you guys are building layer two products today, um, which leverage some of that layer one stuff and add your own sweetness to it. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of buzz right now, very timely, even in just the past couple of weeks, about technologies like auto GPT, uh, baby AGI, um, which are essentially, uh, I don't know if everybody here knows what GitHub is, but that's where all the developers put their code and everything. They are by far the most popular repositories on the planet in just a couple of weeks. Um, it's really crazy. And so what they're doing is they're stringing together additional tools to extend what something like a chat GPT can do, right? And that means uh, maybe we'll have multiple chat GPTs working together. One is responsible for creating a task list. Another one is responsible for um, summarizing information. Another is doing research on the internet through a web browser. Um, and the last one is making sure you're not doing anything unethical or whatever, right? Like there's all these different things that get plugged into them. And there's some of them have access to get to APIs and everything and, and they're, the theory of these things that they built is that you can give it instructions and goals and then it will just go off and do its own thing. And those little systems will work together, create a test list, do a thing, go search, come back. Um, Arjun, you, you kind of mentioned uh, when we were chatting earlier that you're, you're playing around with some of these tools. I've played around with them as well. The, your words were they seem a little brittle, right? Um, so I guess the, the question is, you know, what do you see these things turning into in, in the short term? And then how do you think it affects the entire ecosystem moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the possibilities are really amazing. So uh, I think just to kind of underscore what you just said, um, I've seen demos where you can have like a personal advisory panel set up using things like uh, AutoGPT or Baby AGI and variants of that where you have like uh, Elon Musk giving you advice, right? Like the Elon Musk uh, mm -hmm. AGI uh, or like Jeff Bezos and like all these uh, people who might be experts in their field could be giving you advice, uh, expert advice on marketing and uh, customer support, like all the different functions of a company. So I think like kind of what Vinny was describing, it, it really changes what it means to be a company in, in this kind of world. And already people are talking about like, you know, if you go 15 minutes late, you get the summary 
maybe you don't need to go to the meeting at all, and you know, every, it's just like your agents all go to the meeting and then interact with each other and then report back. And so, so I think it's sort of going in very interesting directions um, just in terms of the possibilities. But, uh, but I think today, uh, and it's sort of remarkable in that you mentioned the GitHub stars, it's, yeah, auto GPT has gone up to something like 85,000 GitHub stars. It's like the fastest uh, growing uh, community uh, ever. Like PyTorch, which was like a very popular deep learning framework and it's been around for many, many years, is only at something like 75,000 stars. So just to kind of give us a sense of how much these things are growing. Uh, but it, yeah, it is still very brittle. So I think in terms of getting it into production, it'll be a journey, but it doesn't seem insurmountable. Like in the next year or two, we'll have the kind of tooling needed to, to get us there. Yeah. Vinny, do you have anything to add I, on this? I, I think like what we're building and a lot of people in the code of the layer two on top of, of this technology, it, it, to me it seems very um, like, you know, I would say llama agnostic, <laughs> large language model agnostic. I think if you build the user interfaces, so we're, we're always building as agents and user interfaces. So these things run by themselves. We're, we're tapping into open AI right now, but if something better comes along, we can just switch out the model and we just move to a different model. So, so the big guys are gonna all compete. Open AI, Microsoft, Google, whoever, Facebook, anyone who comes along, they can all compete in a very sort of meritocratic way to a large extent to build the best intelligence. And the companies that are adopting it right now and building the, the sort of layer two above it, it's abstracted. So we can just move from one model to another. We don't, like, we don't care. I mean, we care insofar as like, there is effort in moving from one to another, but it's not, it's not you know, it, it's, 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 I'd say reasonably trivial. Um, and it's, you know, especially like, for example, as they do upgrades from you know, GPT-4 to 4.5 to 5, and other ones come along, we may switch to different models, we may go for upgrade, it still takes work anyway in engineering work to maintain it. So our view is like the user interface, how you interact with these products, that's the most important thing. Um, the reason that ChatGPT took off, it was a user interface which people understood and could touch and use and feel and get access to AI. Um, you know, I think it's kind of surprising already that Siri and uh, probably Google Assistant and a, a few others, these, you know, uh, they haven't moved across to, to AI yet. I mean, Siri is pretty dumb. If you, uh, if, you know, even Alexa, like it's, it's pretty stupid. When you ask Alexa questions, she, I've Googled the web and I found this information and you have to, like, I'm like, we're in a world of ChatGPT, but it's because the big companies can't move fast enough. They can't innovate, and this is the opportunity for startups. If you're doing a startup today where you can start layering AI, it's gonna give you a massive edge over the big players because they're just too slow. Like, people ask me, aren't you worried about Zoom? I'm like, no. <laughs> By the time Zoom actually does anything, it's like two years from now because they've got to worry about all their big corporate customers, all their privacy laws in these 50 countries they operate in, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna go after the, the part of the market that that you know, we can tackle with great products and features that they can't offer to anyone yet because they're trying to figure out their big customer base. This is, the, this is like Clay Christensen at his best, right? <laughs> creative, creative destruction. Like we can go out there and Zoom may not be the biggest player in five years time. I mean, I, I, I think their strategy is flawed. Um, you know, I think if it's one of the big players, I'd probably say Google Hangouts. They probably have a better chance of doing it. But um, I do think this is the era of disruption where startups have, we, we now have an edge back. For the, past, for the past 15 years, we haven't really had an edge. I mean, it's just, you know, living in the valley for a while, I can tell you it was always, you know how many meetings I was involved, I mean, I, I invested in hundreds of companies. And so, you know how many meetings that I've, I've had or I've, I've heard about from startups investing, they go to the big company, they tell them what they're doing, and then they go and just copy it and roll it out. And there's even been lawsuits and guys have lost money and you know, VCs have sued, like even Best Buy got sued about it as well. I don't think that's the case anymore. This is a catalytic event, and I don't think they can move fast enough. Afif, anything to add? Uh, it's hard to add a lot more to all that. I, I would say, just to maybe give you a different, right now, if you're looking to start a company, it, it's not really, the AI companies that are interesting anymore. In fact, I think the funding's kind of dried up there. Everyone's like, okay, there's a million of these now. But it's how you apply it to solve a problem. I mean, that's what SaaS was always about, right? I mean, software. I mean, if you, you were solving a problem with software, now you're solving a problem with probably still software, but with these AIs integrated. And so you could think of any problem out there, and it's probably got a software application today, 
But again, I think those are antiquated already, just like that. And, and your idea is how do I go solve that problem in a new way, in a more transformational way? And across every category, you're either gonna see somebody in the category leapfrog everyone else, or somebody new come in and take over because everybody else kept thinking what they were doing yesterday was still good enough. So from that perspective, I think it's, it's transformational. I also think the ecosystem around it, right? So not even using it, but trying to control it. So look at the carbon footprint it's putting out. Nobody really talks about that, but it takes a lot to run these models. Uh, we gotta solve that. Um, look at the sort of adverse events that are happening with AI. There are you know, 30 times more bad things that are happening, we'll put it that way. Um, how are you gonna control you know, kids cheating on their essays? How are you gonna control like fraud in the market? How, like, unfortunately, the applications can also be very negative and there are all these controls and all this legislature. And I mean, it's just creating, it's creating a whole new world, certainly in new industries, but a whole new ecosystem of, of problems that as a society we also have to deal with that are opportunities for smart people to go in and solve problems. Yeah, it's a great segue into one of the, the questions I wanted to throw you guys away at some point. Um, we can jump to it now is, you know, you kind of hinted at some things that are potentially going to be problematic. Um, what are some of the things you guys are concerned about? What are you worried about? Um, anything keeping you up at night as to what our future is going to look like, not just for ourselves, but, you know, our kids and siblings and everything like that? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I think, I think we're going to see massive job losses through AI. And I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Um, this is, you know, it's like every new industry that evolves, you know, people have to adapt and change and, and you know, reskill. But I think we've got a, a, we're in a very difficult spot now where companies looking to cut down, let's, say we, let's just say we had a recession in the US right now. Um, engineers are becoming far more productive. We've seen in our own company, like our engineers can do three or four, I mean, we at 17 people and we're not hiring anyone. I mean, we're literally using a open AI to build code for us and integrations and whatever else. So we don't need to hire any more people. We've, we've stopped hiring and we're just like, you know, using the existing people who understand the code base to, to, to do more things. Um, I've got friends and people in my circle that are using, uh, that have stopped outsourcing to Eastern Europe <laughs> to do stuff uh, because they just do it themselves in open AI. They're they having content created for podcasts. They're having, uh, like, it, it's, I mean, this, I probably have like 50 different anecdotes I can tell you, but they're using AI to replace human labor. And so people on, even when it comes to art and video and generative art, and um, you know, I'm involved in another company that we, we spoke to a, a studio to do a movie for us. Like, you know, it's like, uh, it's a, uh, like a cartoon, kind of a promotional thing. And they wanted to take 18 months to use the brand and IP to create this video for like maybe even 45 minutes or a year, you know, storyboarding. We, we're like, we look at AI and we look at what's possible today, probably get it done in three months and you know, three to six months. And so, and that, and that window is shortening every day as the improvements come out, runway ML and all the, you know, all the other uh, generative art products coming out. We're seeing improvements every day. So I think like the animation industry is in trouble. I think, um, you know, and big companies, when you start cutting down on people and say, get, get this, this work done faster with less people, and you can go use AI and use a subscription to ChatGPT or whatever, you're going to see a lot of job losses. So this goes in the whole like, you know, so you're asking what I worry about is like, how do, we, how do we combat that? Obviously, one of the solutions that's been proposed is UBI. Does it really work? We have enough debt. So there's a, a big macro situation. And then there's this AI disruptive force coming. I don't have the answers. I'm just saying that's the stuff I think about and worry about. So slightly contrarian view. I think, I think there will be a shift of jobs. I mean, I think much like software came in and it made humans more efficient, and so jobs were lost. But look at all the ones that were created. I feel in the same way that we're going to evolve and find new things to do with the technology. It's what humans do. I mean, we're actually a relatively inefficient species, right? If we want to get from point A to point B, there's probably two dozen mammals that can get there faster. But guess what? We can build a bicycle, right, or a motorcycle, or now, you know, we can go to the moon. Like, this is what we do. And our parents all said, w when we got the calculator, oh, how will they ever do math again, right? Pretty sure everyone here is pretty decent at math. Um, this is just another tool for humanity to build on top of. I think things will change, and there's fear, and there's definitely going to be job loss, but I also think there's going to be job creation <laughs> in a lot of ways. Now, 
on a separate front, things like ownership and, and, and create, I mean like who owns images now with AI? Who owns you know, books? I mean, this thing can write, this thing can create. The, you know, it, it doesn't need us as original humans. We sort of pegged ourselves as we have this uniqueness to us. We can do something others can't. I don't know, maybe not. Um, maybe this machine can do a lot of things we can do. And so I think there are problems, there are legislations that need to control it. Um, and I think in the short term, there's definitely a lot of efficiencies to gain, but unfortunately as humans, we don't stop. Like when we gain an efficiency, we don't go sit on the couch and like, cool, I got extra time. We go do more with that time. And whatever we do more of, it's gonna require more of us. And so I think that part. How many, mil how many millennials do you employ? Um, yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, we, we got, I, get, I get the joke, trust me, we got them. Um, but, but nonetheless, I, I, I do think there'll be a whole new, you know, even on LinkedIn now, people who are out of work, I see them say, prompt engineer. Yeah. God bless them. I mean, like, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. You know, you got to tip your hat to that. And guess what? Some companies need prompt engineers. Yeah. It's a thing. Um, even PhDs, like, when did the last time you saw real PhDs in companies? They used to be in academia. They're in industry now. They're full of them. Like, they are wanted because they understand these models, the data science, the machine learning. So I just, I think it's going to be an evolution more than anything. Um, and there's a segment of humanity that fears that kind of thing, and then there's a segment that understands that as humanity, it's actually how we continue to evolve, uh, is by jumping on new technologies and building on top of them to do new things. Yeah, and uh, so AI in general has been through a number of hype cycles, right, where I remember a few years back, AI was the big thing, and everybody, every company that we were looking at or involved in, everybody had AI. None of them were actually doing it. Uh, but they all claimed that they had it, and things were much harder back then uh, to actually get real AI into a product. And so I'm curious, do you feel this hype, I mean, I think we may have answered this, but do you feel this hype cycle is different than previous AI hype cycles? And if so, in what ways, Arjun? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think the underlying technology is for real this time, and, and there's a lot of uh, capabilities that it's unlocked. So, and, and just in, even in terms of how much simpler it is to build and deploy features based on these models compared to how it used to be in the past. Like in the past, if I wanted something for summarization or question answering or sentiment classification, I'd have to collect data for each of those separate things, build a model, deploy it, manage all that infrastructure. And, and now it's basically like a prompt into ChatGPT and I can get all these different capabilities out of the same model. So there's, there's something fundamental in the technology that's changed that's made it more accessible. Uh, but I think in terms of sustainability of, of the field, I think it is gonna move forward. In terms of individual companies, there's a whole bunch of them raising a lot of money, uh, which are just like very thin wrappers around uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI. And, and there, I think a lot of them are not gonna make it unless they're able to build some kind of moat and, and the mode could be a combination of UX plus unique kind of users, go to market, uh, or it could be trying to go deeper in terms of building proprietary language models which are based on that user data or some domain specific data. Yeah. What happens when ChatGPT is creating so much content and humans have stopped creating content? What's it gonna learn from? Itself. <laughs> Maybe, maybe the better question is, what's it, what's it gonna realize? Yeah. Right, what's it gonna think of us when it learns so much? <laughs> yeah, that's maybe the scarier question. Sounds very Terminator-ish. Um, so we've got about uh, 10 minutes left here, and I do wanna uh, allow everybody to ask some questions. Um, so I don't know if we have Mike, but I already see a ton of hands going up. This was the first one over here, so go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and stand up and speak loud too, if you don't mind. Bob Greenis, uh, locally here, and uh, I've been, I'm a physician, and there's been a lot of discussion in our discussion boards about uh, the uh, ability to fabricate uh, when you don't know the answer. And uh, you talk about the negative effect. Uh, are, you, are you seeing in the more like, focused applications that you're doing where you set goals that there's situations where 
it doesn't you know and it makes up something and you have to watch out for it. What are the cautions yeah. and how, how do you do that? Actually, we ran into this problem. So we, we, we ran, so again, marketing platform, we want to be very responsive to consumers. Consumers have all these complaints, and so we deployed GPT to respond to them and say, hey, sorry, you had this issue. But before we knew it, it was trying to solve the issues. Like someone would say, hey, I tripped on a crack outside of the McDonald's. And they'd be like, oh, don't worry, we'll fix that next week. Like, no, you're not going to fix that next week. <laughs> so you have to actually train it to not lie or to, to not say things it can't do. Um, and obviously it learns then, oh, I shouldn't say that, okay, you know, and, and that's what the training models are for. But yeah, you can't just deploy it into the world. I think IBM deployed its thing, Watson, onto Twitter like 10 years ago. Anyone remember this? <coughs> it came back like a racist pedophile, like, it was, it, it, like they had to shut it down immediately because it, it learned from us a lot of bad things. <laughs> we have to build the ethics around it. We have to build the guardrails. We have to teach it not to lie and not to, uh, uh, not to try to be something it's not and it, that it's okay to not know and all these things that we teach our children, we kind of have to train the models with as well. How do you know when it turns loose though? How do you uh, say it is? By testing it, honestly, by continuing to deploy it and see where it fails you, yeah. You, you create another chat GPT that analyzes all the responses and sees if it's objectionable or not. Um, yeah, I, I, I created, a, I, I have ChatGPT on my, as an app on my phone that I can ask it questions to, and of course it's the raw one, but I, I, for my son's iPad, I created KidGPT, and I'm trying to prompt it where it's like, hey, like, he wants to ask questions, but he's eight years old. Like, don't tell him stuff he doesn't need to know. And I still, I'll ask it a question every once in a while, and it's, I'm like, oh no, no, you're not ready yet. Like, and so it's hard to get it to, to do those things where it's not telling things you don't want it to. Um, Which is, by the way, is probably the biggest, scariest part of this. Like, sure. technology like this in the wrong hands can start to do really nefarious things. Just to follow up, does it persist its memory at least so that it actually does improve, or is it every session is a new uh, so, opportunity for uh, fabrication? Oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Yeah, I mean, ChatGPT itself has got a little bit of memory, but it's, it's semi-limited. There's tools like uh, Langchain and others that are helping to give it more long-term memory, and those are some of those layer two sort of applications and things that, that AutoGPT and a bunch of them are leveraging. Um, so I think that's coming. Um, but you know, right now, the thread, you're essentially, every time you reach out to ChatGPT, you're sending the entire thread again so it has that context. Um, so anyway, we have another question over here. Yeah, I, I, I have two questions. One is just a quick sort of follow-up to that. So do you, do, and any of you can answer this question, do you believe that we should disclose as to follow this train of the source of truth? Because the, the problem here is we no longer know what is the source of truth, whether it's economic, a business decision, political, it doesn't matter what it is. And you're creating models that we don't know whether to trust it or not. So is there some method that you believe for large language models or even specialized models? I work a lot in the FinTech business and you know, there's a lot of regulation in what is really the source of truth. My second question is really for Vinny, is in Weight Room or any other sort of AI-based model, are we dealing with the issue of nonverbal communication? How do you deal with that? You, Vinny, use your arms like I do a lot when you talk, you nod your head. How are you dealing with that issue with AI? Thank you. I can take the first one. So um, I think related to what um, uh, Al was mentioning with Langchain, there's approaches where you can retrieve from different databases the ground truth and reference that as part of the response that the large language model is giving out. And uh, people are creating search engines. Like you can see this in Bing as part of their use of uh, GPT. They show you the reference from where they drew the response. And, and there's other search engines like Perplexity that are doing that as well. So, um, so I think that's kind of the best sort of uh, state of the art thing that's out there right now. Of course, eventually we'd want the language model <coughs> to be better at being able to source where it got the information from to increase reliability. And so from our side, right now, we're basically just doing audio transcription. So everyone in a meeting speaking, we're listening to what they say, and uh, we're working out you know, summaries, tasks, follow-ups, et cetera. The, we're actually busy building a bot as well. So there'll be like a virtual person in a meeting who can be the secretary or the 
whoever it is of the meeting. Um, but we put them, wouldn't deploy that anytime soon, but just it's more for training and getting people to use the product and understand the product. I can definitely see a world in three to five years where um, instead of just doing audio analysis, it's analyzing video as well. Obviously, it's more compute intensive, and we're not, we're not there yet on, on, on the compute power side. But I'd say within five years, that's probably uh, practical, where it's just analyzing every frame of every video, looking for micro expressions, uh, and, 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 and sort of noting that to the, to the transcripts as well. Next questions? That's my beautiful wife, by the way, Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Brian <laughs> Cooper here. So great panel. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, Al, like you, you said, this, uh, this new technology, I went to my first AI conference in 1986. <laughs> uh, so this has been talked about for a long time. And in the early 2000s, there were some great AI, actually, that did intrusion detection on networks. And they could figure out what a normal network looks like and then would flag anomalies. And then you taught it based upon saying whether that was a false positive or a false negative or whatever. I'm still struggling, actually, to understand what is, quote unquote, real AI and what has changed. Uh, Vinny, your application sounds amazing, but I don't, it doesn't strike me as anything that you're doing that actually requires AI. So I guess question is, what is, what is AI? <laughs> it's actually a really good question. I mean, at the end of the day, that look, you've got data science, which, again, since the, forever, right? Just looking at data and drawing correlations. And now I think it's just a matter of volume. Like what is humanly possible and what do you need the machine to do? That there's distinctions there on the data science side. Then you have the machine learning side where you actually then, maybe based on data, but maybe not, you're teaching a non-human to go do tasks repeatedly. And when you marry the two, so for us, when you marry the two of taking the data to drive decision making to deliver tasks, to us that's a real you know, fantastic use of AI. Um, and that's what we're striving to, and that should change the things that we can accomplish as, as, a, as a race, as, as humanity, when we have now machines doing things that used to take us, and frankly, maybe we couldn't even throw enough bodies at it to do, right? Large volume data married with, with task, you know, repeated, repeatable tasks and decision making, to me, is, is the great use of AI, but anywhere in that spectrum, um, is, is something called AI or data science or machine learning. So I think it's going to be harder to put an arm around it and what is AI and just focus more on like how do we apply it to functionally help yeah, us. Yeah, so I, I like that. I mean, a couple commenters have said like, well, how are we going to get to the truth? And the fact of the matter is human beings don't agree on what the truth is. So I'm not sure how AI is going to get to any truth. <laughs> From what I've read, chat, these things create super mediocre, banal essays but I mean, that's not unlike the rest of the internet anyway. You attach that to an engage, a Facebook engagement model. Maybe we're just going, going to automate the most mediocre part of the internet and, and uh, startup founders like yourselves can actually go and create value in the world. I think why this one's different is it's so accessible. Like everyone can use it. My eight-year-old can use it, Which right? is scary as right? well as great, right? different, different than big data, right? Before, like a decade ago, it was big data and you know the, the ability to analyze big data sets. but who was going to use that? Nobody was using that. And now everybody's using this, right? And now that it's accessible and, and, and we can utilize it, I, I feel like that's been, that's been the mark of why now suddenly we all want to integrate it, because it's, it's easy, right? It's, it's functional. It, it, it works in a manner that we like to work. Well, well, let, and let's put things in context on a timeline basis. Like, this technology, I mean, 18 months ago, no one in this room probably would have known what GPT-3 was, right? No one. Yeah, maybe one or two people. <laughs> yeah. Um, today, everyone knows what ChatGPT is, just about, and um, you know that's in a, a very short space of time. We're in the infancy of what this could be. So, like a lot of the stuff we, we're coming up with right now is like you know we're we're, we're looking forward. We're saying how big can this get? What could it do? Yes, it'll look, will it you know destroy jobs? Will it create jobs longer term? Like we're trying to figure out what the, what is the continuum for this, and at, at what juncture this really becomes uh, totally disruptive. Um, I think if you don't put the work in now, when it happens, you'll be too far behind to actually take advantage of it. So, uh, you know, the people working in AI and startups right now are, are saying, we're willing to wait it out. It's maybe, maybe it's 12 months, maybe it's 48 months, but it's going to happen. And let's, and let's keep iterating and improving the models. And that is a perfect end. We have 10 seconds left, sorry. <laughs> uh, catch up with these guys after, or we can chat afterwards. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. This was a great panel. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.
Better meet you, man. You, you too, you too. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.